morning, good afternoon, good evening. Very honored to have uh, Professor Andrea, Professor uh, Chai, Professor Isu, Dr. Kathy, Dr. Irene to be with us for the fifth ACNN webinar. So, uh, without further delay, I would like to uh, brief a little bit on the ACNN. So today our speakers, our first speakers will be Professor Andrea Doboboy. He is a professor of neurosurgery at SDI Federal Neurosurgical Center, Northeast Russia Federation. And his topic today will be equipment of neurovascular operation. Our second speaker will be Dr. Yuki. She is an epilepsy nurse practitioner. She's attached to the team of US. Her topic today will be pediatric epilepsy, initial treatment management and surgical consideration. Our chairs for today the first session will be Professor Yachai Sakanicha, uh, Professor Department of Neurosurgical Brain and Cerebral Vascular Center, Tansin Hospital, Bangkok. And is also specialized in cerebral vascular surgery and interventional neuropathology. And our second chair will be Dr. Kathy Hatsrat, Director of Advanced Practice Professional Development, Children's Mercy Casas, TUS. And our commentators for the day will be Professor Toyoshi Ito, and he's the Associate Professor, Department of Neurosurgery, University Graduate School of Biochemical Science, Sakamoto, Nagasaki, Japan. Our second commentator will be Professor Adi. He is the Senior Teaching Assistant in Neuroscience and Surgery. Clinical Center of University in Sarojavo, Sarojavo School of Science and Technology. I think without further delay, may I call upon Professor Yoko Kato to say a few words. So thank you very much for joining today's uh, SNN uh, the webinar. And today's webinar is so gorgeous, with so uh, good speakers and the chairs and commentators. So we are very much looking forward to listening all your comments and also the talk. Thank you very much. May I invite Professor Chai to share to chair the first session. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Professor Yoko Kado and all of uh all, all of us. Okay, uh, for I will start for uh, to be the Chairperson for the uh, for the first topic, the first topic uh, will be uh, is a very well known neurovascular surgeon. He is outstanding neurovascular surgeon, and he also be a big brother of my lovely friends, uh, Professor Andre uh, Dobowoy. Uh, Professor Andre Dobowoy have like a, a, a much experience to surgery. Uh, especially in the complex uh, cerebral aneurysm. <coughs> he, he performed more than 2,000 cerebral aneurysm surgery, including more than 200 AVM surgery. And also he uh, also performed the revascularization or bypass surgery. And now he currently work in the uh, Federation Center of uh, Neurosurgery uh, at uh, Novo's uh, in Russian. Uh, 
He also have uh, experience to study from the Master of Neurovascular Surgeon, uh, such as Professor Yoko Kato, Professor uh, Lokuya Tanigawa, Professor Tagizawa, and also Professor Michael Lawton. So today he will uh, talk about the e uh, equipment of uh, neurovascular operations. We have very lucky to uh, see him to give some the valuable lectures. Uh, please, Professor Andre. Thank you, teacher. Uh, hello, dear friends. Hello, Professor Yokakata. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak at this uh, CNN uh, fifth educational webinar. Uh, one second, please, I share my screen. Uh, today we will talk about uh, neurosurgical equipment for neurovascular operations. Modern neurosurgery is a very high-tech industry. Uh, modern neurosurgical operation room looks like the control cabin of the spacecraft. Many modern high-tech devices and tools help the neurosurgical to achieve neurosurgical neurosurgeon to achieve uh, the best neurosurgical results. All equipment and tools can um, be conditionally divided into basic, which is used in all neurosurgical operation, and additional, which is used only for neurovascular operation. At first, we will talk about basic equipment. Uh, first of all, we need uh, to have a multifunctional operation table. Uh, the patient can be uh, placed in uh, this operation table. The operation table uh, can, uh, can uh, con consist with a removable uh, headrest uh, for attaching a uh, Sujita or Mayfield uh, clamp. And uh, uh, operation table need to be in a uh, changeable uh, height. Uh, uh, operation table need to have uh, side rails uh, to attach additional equipment to these side rails. And of course, uh, it need uh, a remote control to, uh, to change a position during the operation and before operation. And uh, of course, uh, each multifunctional operation table can be uh, placed in different positions. Uh, you can see the many different positions of operation table at this slide. Uh, for example, this is side position of patient, uh, this is sitting position of patient, this is prone position of patient. Of course, uh, each uh, operation table uh, can uh, conflict in uh, many other uh, uh, good equipments. Uh, for example, silicone pads of various shapes uh, to reduce pressure at the points of contact between the patient and body, uh, patient body and the table. Uh, Armrests uh, uh, and uh, other um, uh, devices. Supports, for example. Uh, in each operation room, uh, need uh, sh should be uh, uh, lamps to eliminate the operation field. Some operation rooms have not one, but two or even more eliminators. Uh, in uh, uh, operation room may be uh, built in uh, uh, CCD camera to translate uh, the operation field to another places, uh, to the local uh, network or to the internet and uh, each operation uh, uh, shadows uh, less illuminator uh, has a control panel uh, for uh, reducing or increasing uh, a light of uh, each illuminator. Of course, uh, surgical chair is very useful thing for neurosurgeon, uh, especially for neurovascular operation. It has arm rests, uh, with changeable position to minimize hand tremor, uh, back support for back of neurosurgeon, electrical drive 
to change the head of uh, surgeon relative to the operation field. And of course, wheels for easy movement around the operation table. Head fixation. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, two uh, different types of head fixation. Uh, uh, Mayfield clamp, this is a three uh, point head fixation. And Sujita clamp, this is a four point head fixation. Uh, for example, uh, you can see the slide with uh, fixation of the head of patient with the Mayfield clamp. Uh, retraction system. Uh, uh, you can see at this slide a scalp hood, uh, hook retraction uh, with three hooks uh, um, uh, attached to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, Leila and uh, another type of uh, uh, skin uh, and scalp retractor Dora Luna retractors. Uh, of course, we need a brain retractors. This is a Leila brain retractor. This is a Jutia brain retractor. And of course, we need uh, to use a flexible sp spatulas uh, of different uh, size and different uh, diameters. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, each uh, flexible uh, spatula may be uh, uh, maybe fixed uh, to one or two uh, or uh, maybe in uh, other si uh, situations maybe three uh, brain retractors and of course uh, the diamond of uh, neurosurgical equipment and this is operation microscope operation microscopes uh, uh, for neurosurgery are produced by several companies in the world uh, all of them are different from each other and worthy to use this is a very complex optical mechanical electronic device uh, to ensure sterility for uh, operation microscope uh, uh, it uh, must be covered with a sterile uh, shells uh, you can see uh, at the middle uh, microscope uh, covered by sterile shells and uh, you can see the head of the microscope uh, the head uh, has eliminators and uh, hand grips and uh, eye pieces for neurosurgeon and uh, for assistant. And of course, uh, uh, some was about uh, built-in mod models. Uh, re uh, realistic image uh, uh, from microscope is cool. But sometimes surgeons uh, need to look, uh, for example, how blood is coming through the vessels uh, or check the tumor uh, bed for residual parts. Uh, in each case, uh, he must be used uh, uh, different uh, built-in mo models. Uh, for example, ICG video angiography, ICG flow, uh, uh, yellow uh, 560 and uh, blue 400 for uh, residual part of uh, malignant tumors. Uh, in case uh, of surgeon um, uh, want to uh, uh, do, do not uh, want to regularly remove uh, his hands from the operated field, he can use a foot switch. Uh, this greatly saves operation time. Uh, the uh, control of all functions of microscope uh, may be programmed uh, on this uh, foot switch. Uh, sometimes uh, surgical may use uh, surgical glasses with built-in magnifiers. Uh, some stages, for example, uh, approach uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, sc scalp uh, stage, uh, a bone stage, and uh, may in maybe in uh, uh, in different uh, situations maybe open the dura. A surgeon can perform under the glasses with magnifiers, and of course uh, uh, for removable uh, for removing. Uh, uh, cavernous malformation 
of uh, or uh, deep uh, located AVMs, neurosurgeon can use a neurosurgical navigation uh, sta station. Uh, the stations can be uh, different uh, uh, types, uh, and uh, some stations can be connected with microscope uh, and uh, show the picture into the eyes piece. Of course, uh, Modern uh, neurosurgery uh, cannot be imagined without uh, electrocoagulation. For accurate coagulation of vessels in hard to reach places, it is necessary to have bipolar forceps uh, of various shapes and sizes. And uh, modern elect electrosurgical uh, devices allow to finally adjust the power settings. Uh, for perform craniotomy fast, Nowadays, neurosurgeon uh, can be used a power equipment, uh, for example, perforator, uh, craniotom, and drill. The di diameter of the cra uh, craniotom and the perforator uh, can be uh, small for child head and standard for adults. Uh, the working part of the craniotom can be uh, different uh, of different lengths. Uh, there are two different uh, types of bars. This uh, you can see cutting bars uh, for fast uh, remo remove uh, the bone and the diamond uh, bars uh, for uh, precision uh, remove the bone. Uh, surgical aspirator, uh, one of the most essential item in the operating room. Uh, for neurovascular operations, usually should be used uh, two aspirators, because in cases of strong bleeding from ruptured aneurysm or AVM, one aspirator cannot be adequate aspirate uh, coming blood. Also, surgeon can be used uh, different size and lengths of uh, aspirator uh, cannulas uh, for adequate uh, dissection of the vascular structures. In uh, some cases, uh, the surgeon uh, need to uh, use uh, a warm uh, solution uh, for irrigate uh, the brain during the operation. Uh, you can see infrared thermal bus for heating solutions. Uh, solutions uh, should be uh, a temperature of 33 degrees of uh, 37 degrees of uh, Celsius. Uh, next, additional neurosurgical equipment for neurovascular operations. In some cases, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, sorry, we have uh, a very strong uh, bleeding, uh, or not strong, but ongoing bleeding. In these cases, we can use uh, blood outer transfusion, outer transfusion uh, device. Uh, this device. Uh, can be uh, cats or uh, another type, uh, cell saver, for example, uh, e and the use uh, in uh, surgery of cerebral AVMs for uh, reducing uh, uh, need uh, for use of donut uh, bl blood. And for uh, cases of uh, surgery of cerebral aneurysms, it allows to replenish blood loss uh, at the expense of this patient's uh, own blood uh, and uh, must be always uh, ready to quickly connect uh, consumables, hose and filter system. Uh, in uh, diff difficult cases uh, of aneurysms, uh, we can use endoscopic equipment. Uh, 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 for example, we can use uh, rigid endoscopics of, of uh, 0, 30, or 45 degrees for assistance during uh, work in, in narrow spaces. For example, uh, in uh, basal uh, cisterns, uh, where located the most of any reasons. And uh, sometimes uh, it can be used uh, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, ventricular endoscopy during uh, uh, during uh, rare uh, rare uh, uh, 
uh, approach for uh, any reason, for example, for any reasons of uh, P1, P2 uh, junction uh, in uh, cases uh, of reaching this uh, any reason uh, during transcorridor approach. Uh, some microscopes uh, um, have built in digital endoscopes. Uh, for example, Kineva uh, has such endoscope, uh, which can be very quickly connected to the microscope. In this case, the surgeon sees the image in the eye species. This is a very useful tool uh, connected to the microscope. And uh, the, this tool, uh, no need to use endoscopic, uh, endoscopic trail uh, in wall, uh, only this uh, endoscopic tool connect, uh, which connected to the microscope. Uh, in some cases, uh, we need uh, to operate. Uh, we need to operate uh, uh, giant uh, thrombosed aneurysm. Uh, we need, in this case, to use ultrasound uh, dis disintegrator. Uh, it uh, is used to remove thrombotic masses from the cavity of uh, giant thrombosed aneurysms. Uh, sometimes the density of blood clots inside the aneurysm uh, is uh, very, uh, uh, very high and uh, they do not go into the simple aspirator and we use uh, disintegrator before uh, they aspirate uh, this uh, thrombos uh, and uh, clots. Uh, of course, uh, this is very useful device, uh, which should be used in each uh, neurovascular operation. Uh, this is ultrasound uh, Doppler. It helps to determine the linear uh, velocity of blood flow and uh, its direction. Uh, 16 megahertz uh, probe with a diameter of one millimeters on, uh, in, in uh, another models, in other models, uh, two millimeters uh, is used. Uh, uh, in this uh, method is indispensable in, in, in uh, vascular and neurosurgery. Uh, sometimes we need to uh, check not only uh, velocity uh, through the um, uh, vessel, but we need uh, to know about uh, volumetric uh, blood flow uh, through the vessels uh, and we uh, can use uh, ultrasound flow meter uh, you can see a dual channel uh, ultrasound uh, flow meter uh, the, this uh, flow meter uh, can be uh, measure uh, simultaneously uh, the volumetric blood flow in two diff different uh, vessels. Uh, for vessels of different diameters, uh, sensor of different diameters with the flexible tips are used. And the next, uh, microsurgical tools for neurovascular operations. Uh, in each operation, neurovascular surgeon uh, can be used uh, a microsurgical uh, bayonet or non-bayonet scissors. Uh, for example, for can be used non-bayonet scissors. Uh, in other cases, uh, in uh, deep of the uh, skull uh, cavity, uh, surgeon can be used uh, bayonet scissors. Uh, of course, uh, many mm, tools uh, uh, for dissection of the aneurysm and another vascular structure can be used uh, by neurosurgeon. Uh, you can see the set of micro dissectors uh, by Roton. Uh, different uh, this mi these micro dissectors have uh, different uh, shapes of the tips and uh, different. Um, uh, lens of the working part and uh, used in uh, different uh, situations. Uh, this set of micro dissectors by uh, Janetta 
uh, especially used for uh, posterior fossa, but sometimes uh, can be used in uh, uh, simple aneurysm surgery and uh, in uh, anterior circulation. Uh, uh, very often, a neurosurgeon uh, can be uh, switching uh, uh, vessels, making bypasses, and uh, in uh, these cases, uh, uh, usually used uh, nylon suture, uh, 10 zeros, sometimes 9 or 11 zeros. Uh, and for switching, uh, some neurosurgeons uh, can be used needle holders. Other neurosurgeons uh, like use uh, uh, microforceps. Uh, uh, microforceps can be um, uh, bayonet for, uh, shape, uh, you can see at this slide, and non bayonet shape, uh, different uh, uh, lengths and uh, different uh, uh, width of uh, the uh, tip. Uh, not uh, in, in each in each uh, forceps, uh, the uh, tip is uh, very very uh, thin uh, because uh, it uh, hold uh, in, it uh, uh, it uh, creating for holding a very very small uh, needle uh, using in uh, ten nine or eleven zeros uh, switching. Um, and of course, uh, we need to use uh, bipolar coagulation forceps uh, of different lengths of working parts, different tip uh, thickness for different pathology. For example, more thickener tip uh, for removing cavernous malformation or for the uh, coagulation of the large feeders of the AVM, and more thinner tip uh, for any reason preparation or for bypass making. Uh, microsurgical uh, uh, um, clip appliers uh, can be uh, different shapes uh, for uh, different angles, uh, uh, for placing clip uh, in uh, different position, and uh, for more comfortable uh, clipping of aneurysmal neck. Uh, some clip appliers uh, had uh, flexible. Uh, a flexible uh, uh, working point uh, and uh, can be uh, can be uh, flexed uh, by a neurosurgeon uh, for a uh, needed position for placing the clip. Uh, many many uh, neurosurgeon uh, can uh, use uh, an original clip set. Uh, in uh, this set, uh, each aneurysm clip uh, located in uh, our own cell, uh, and uh, and uh, these cells can uh, uh, use by uh, its number uh, for uh, for talking with uh, talking uh, neurosurgeon uh, talk uh, for scrap nurses uh, about number of clips and. Uh, uh, she uh, give neurosurgeon a number uh, uh, this uh, form and shape of uh, aneurysm clip. Uh, some words about uh, scrap nurse desk design. Uh, this uh, uh, scrap nurse desk uh, before starting surgery. You can see a power cord uh, from uh, the uh, power uh, machine from uh, uh, for uh, for craniotomy, uh, you can see uh, retraction hooks. Uh, uh, you can see uh, the tanks for uh, uh, solutions. Uh, you can see drape for a microscope, uh, silicone holes uh, for uh, for suction uh, device, and of course you can see. Cotton pads, different uh, types. Uh, this is thick cotton pads. This is a thin cotton pads. Uh, and uh, you can see surgery cell uh, uh, preparing uh, before surgery in different uh, uh, different shape and different uh, size. Uh, you can see uh, surgery cell, uh, cell original and. Uh, 
uh, another type of surgery cell. Uh, some uh, deep centrics, um, uh, for example, uh, a surgery cell uh, cut uh, into uh, pieces of different sizes for uh, uh, for a neurosurgeon uh, who take uh, in each uh, situation uh, a small or big uh, piece of uh, surgery cell. Bone wax uh, is attached to the uh, edge of the tank of warm saline. Uh, in this case, bone wax uh, uh, was uh, more flexible uh, for using uh, in uh, uh, in cases of uh, stop bleeding from uh, the bone. And each type of uh, cotonoids um, uh, in different containers, uh, located in different containers, uh, uh, this uh, container allocate uh, uh, thin uh, cotonoids, this uh, container allocate uh, uh, C cotonoids, all uh, cotonoids, but uh, maybe uh, uh, wet, uh, not uh, dry. And uh, for example, uh, four uh, different uh, aneurysm uh, clip, uh, aneurysm clip uh, sets for different types uh, and different lengths of the aneurysm uh, clip. In this uh, uh, set located only long and fenestrated clips. In this uh, set uh, can be located only uh, small uh, mini clips, and in this set uh, can be located uh, standard clips, and uh, another uh, uh, can be uh, consist uh, uh, temporary clips. In conclusion, I uh, want to say the availability of the necessary equipment and tools is the key to success of neurovascular operations and uh, careful preparation for all stages of surgery has uh, surgical time. In this case, the scrap nurse no need to um, go to another room and uh, uh, take uh, need, needed for a neurosurgeon uh, as a uh, tool. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Professor Andre for a very excellent lecture and give very informative to us. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would like to invite commentator, Professor Ismo. Yes. Hello. Good Hi. evening. Good yeah. evening. Yeah, and Dr. Adi for like, uh, have uh, some comments to the audience related with our Professor Andre lecture, please. Professor Izumo, you can go first. Oh, thank you. For your comments. Uh, thank you, Professor Duboboy, for your excellent presentation about basic equip equipment of neurovascular operations. You covered that uh, in very wide range. I felt that content was very easy to understand for all the audiences. Especially, I was very impressed with your uh, cutting-edge surgical chair. We don't have that kind of uh, comfortable chair. I envy you. Uh, you said you use two kinds of brain retroactors, Ryla and Sugita. My question is, which do you prefer, Ryla uh, or Sugita? And tell me the uh, reason why, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Zuma, for this question. Uh, I uh, prefer to use uh, Sugita uh, retroactors. Uh, uh, it's very comfortable for me. Uh, it's uh, very strong, uh, and uh, sometimes if the, uh, we have cases of brain edema, uh, these retractors uh, uh, very strong uh, retracted the brain tissue, uh, and uh, they uh, have uh, 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 brain spatulas with uh, different uh, um, uh, a shape uh, in uh, other ends. Uh, one spatula has uh, the uh, small or white uh, tip, and uh, uh, it very useful uh, and very quick uh, to uh, uh, to uh, revert the spatula and uh, use uh, 
uh, side with uh, white or with uh, thick uh, part of this spatula. I prefer Siguita. Thank you. And uh, second question is, do you use exoscope for cerebral vascular surgery? In Japan, neurosurgery under exoscope is getting more popular nowadays. I think surgical microscope will be replaced by exoscope in near future. Please show me your opinion about exoscopic surgery, please. Thank you. Uh, we uh, don't have exoscope in our clinic, but uh, we uh, I I can use it in uh, in another clinic where I uh, uh, use uh, when, where I go in to uh, perform a surgery. Uh, I understand uh, and uh, I agree with you. Uh, the in near future uh, the exoscopic surgery. Um, uh, was the first uh, then uh, the uh, endoscope uh, then uh, microscopic surgery uh, because the modern exoscopus uh, uh, is uh, a very high tech uh, device with very uh, high resolution and uh, uh, in uh, most cases uh, it was it was uh, used for perform neurosurgical uh, procedures uh, uh, and for neurovascular too. Uh, but maybe in uh, very rare cases, uh, the microscope uh, will be uh, the better uh, than the exoscope. For example, I think for making a small bypasses uh, because uh, the microscope, uh, microscopic uh, operation field and uh, um, resolution, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, nowadays more higher than the exoscopic. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Duboy, for this wonderful and outstanding lecture. As always, your lectures are really inspiring, for uh, especially for young surgeons. And I really admire your great equipment in your neurovascular center. Uh, I believe that um, for, especially for developing countries as Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, the basic equipment and basic microsurgical and neuroanatomy knowledge is uh, very important. Of course, it's very good if you have uh, all of these um, great tools which you have showed us as a ultrasonic aspirator, etc. Uh, I will have just a, one question since you use uh, two head holders, Mayfield Clamp and Sugita. Which did you find, I can say, more advanced uh, for a positioning of the patient for the vascular um, cases, especially for the aneurysms? Uh, do you uh, prefer one of them or it's just um, how you are used to do it? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adi. Uh, uh, we uh, prefer use uh, Sujita uh, clamp uh, for most of uh, neurovascular precisions, uh, except uh, the precision uh, uh, precisions uh, uh, in uh, posterior fossa. I think the uh, Mayfield clamp more comfortable and more useful in uh, cases of posterior fossa. Mm, this is my uh, opinion about uh, this fact. Uh, and uh, in cases when I operate uh, uh, posterior fossa, for example, uh, clip, uh, uh, clipped the aneurysm of pica, I use a Mayfield clamp. Uh, I very uh, like to use Sujita clamp in cases uh, if I need to perform uh, basal anterior interhemispheric approach. It's very uh, comfortable for me for this approach. And uh, how did you find useful uh, neuronavigation system uh, in aneurysm surgery? I mean, in uh, <clears throat> ruptured cases, if you don't have uh, so much time, do you, do you use it in your center uh, for vascular ruptured cases or just for, um, we can say, uh, elective cases? Uh, no, we uh, don't uh, use uh, neuronavigation system in 
uh, all uh, uh, aneurysm cases. In the ruptured in, and elective cases, we don't uh, need to use uh, yes. navigation system. Mm, but I think uh, sometimes in uh, different uh, kinds uh, of aneurysm, uh, the young neurosurgeon can be used uh, this uh, system. Uh, for example, for uh, very fast reaching uh, for ruptured aneurysm of uh, pericolosal artery. It's yeah. very uh, useful. Good, good. Okay, thank you. And for also as a comment uh, for exoscope, I believe, especially in deep locations, uh, for example, contralateral MCA aneurysm, uh, the exoscope has still to uh, be more advanced. To, so it can change the endoscopic inspection by current, my opinion, as a, as a young neurosurgeon. Anyway, a great lecture one more time, and thank you for sharing your great experience. <clears throat> thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yes, great. I now call upon Professor Ike to do the closing for the session. First session, closing remarks, please, from Yes, uh, at finally, I would like to uh, uh, thank you very much to Professor uh, Andre, who's my lovely big brother, uh, to giving a uh, very excellent uh, talk uh, to SNN uh, about the uh, principle of uh, neurosurgical operation device from the uh, uh, basic to advanced instruments that we have to know and we can apply this uh, uh, ratio to our operation. Yeah, thank you very much. And I let's to uh, move to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now invite uh, Dr. Katie introduce Dr. Iri and chair the second session. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. Hello, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Erin Feske, and to chair her session today. Currently, Erin works as an epilepsy nurse practitioner at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and she's a well-respected member of the neuroscience nursing community. She received her Master of Science degree as a pediatric nurse practitioner from Rush University in Chicago and her Doctor of Nursing practice from Duke University. Erin is very active in her professional organization, serving as a director at large for the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses and the Agnes Marshall Walker Foundation. She is a member of the American Epilepsy Society and serves on the Psychosocial Committee as well as chair of the Advanced Practice Provider Special Interest Group. She's also a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Child and Youth with Epilepsy Committee, representing the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Dr. Feske has numerous publications and national and international presentations. She even finds time to volunteer for the Medical Reserve Corps of Kansas City and is a seizure first aid speaker for the Epilepsy Foundation. I am very pleased to present Dr. Erin Feske. Thank you so much, Dr. Kathy Carre. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, ACNN, for inviting me. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to get to share some information on epilepsy and seizures. So I'm just going to share my screen here with you all. I hope you can all see that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about pediatric epilepsy, which, as Kathy mentioned, is my passion and my love. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest or relationships with industry to disclose with you all today. You can see our objectives here. We're going to talk about some of those basic signs and symptoms of epilepsy, talk about some of the testing associated with the surgical evaluation, and then talking about some of that initial medication management. Um, so these are all things that I could spend days talking about. So we're going to talk very briefly about each of these. So it's important when we think about seizures that we recognize that this is a temporary dysfunction of the brain. 
it's caused by a self-limited abnormal hypersynchronous discharge. So I know when we all think about our neurons, we think that they should be talking to each other, right? They need to be sending signals to each other. They need to be communicating, but I don't want them to be too in sync with each other because when you get that synchronous, that hypersynchronous activity, that's when you're gonna get abnormal activity and seizures. And then this is just a lovely bookmark that I have from the um, Anita Kaufman Foundation that says anyone with a brain can have a seizure. I think it's a great reminder to us that this can impact anybody and any one of us. So we think about seizures, we have to divide them into two big buckets. Um, they are provoked seizures and there are unprovoked seizures. And it's really important to divide that because it's gonna change our treatment approach. For provoked seizures, we're obviously gonna be treating the provoking factor, right? We're gonna be treating why they have a seizure, not necessarily ongoing seizures. And for unprovoked, that's where we're talking about epilepsy. And I put a big old arrow here on febrile seizures because in pediatrics, that's the most common provoked seizure that we see causes a lot of anxiety for families. And so it's important that we understand that this is not epilepsy, but it does require some attention. So just a brief note about febrile seizures. This happens for about three to 4% of all children common between six months to five years of age, although it can happen outside of that, but it's always a little bit of a flag to us if we see it outside that age range. For febrile seizures, we wanna categorize them into one of two things either simple febrile seizures or complex febrile seizures. And you can see the breakout there, but essentially a simple febrile seizure is a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So there's no focal features to that seizure. It's less than 15 minutes. We call that brief. I always tell families my definition of brief is different from yours, but we call that a brief seizure. And simple febrile seizures are not associated with an increased development of epilepsy down the road. So that's important for us to share with the families. Complex febrile seizures are kind of the opposite, right? So they're a seizure that's longer than 15 minutes, more than one occurring in 24 hours, or most importantly, a seizure that has focal features. Uh, so if there's one side of the body or we have deviation of the head or eyes to one side, that is a complex febrile seizure. And the big difference with that is that is associated with an increased risk for epilepsy development down the road. So again, febrile seizures aren't epilepsy, but it's important to differentiate if it's a risk factor for epilepsy development. And when we think about febrile seizures, we're not typically going to give these children anti-seizure medication to take on a daily basis. Um, I often will prescribe a benzodiazepine of some kind for these patients so that they have a medicine in the event of a prolonged seizure, um, but they're not going to take anything routinely. But again, this is going to be counseling and talking about that future risk. So now let's shift and talk about that whole unprovoked bucket and epilepsy, right? So it's helpful that we have the ILAE, which is the International League Against Epilepsy, um, and they have defined epilepsy for us. So epilepsy is more than one unprovoked seizure occurring greater than 24 hours apart. And they updated it in about 2017 to also include an unprovoked seizure with evidence of increased risk for further seizures. So that definition is symptomatic, right? It's saying that somebody's had a seizure or they've had multiple seizures um, and they are, continue to be at risk for increased seizures. It's important that a diagnosis of epilepsy doesn't talk at all about etiology. And so we don't have any information about cause or prognosis for these patients. I always like to pause here also and remind all of us that this definition doesn't have any testing a part of it, right? There's no they must have an EEG or they must have an MRI. It's saying, hey, the person had more than one seizure occurring greater than 24 hours apart, or they had a seizure and they have risk factors for additional seizures. Now, could those risk factors be an abnormal EEG or an abnormal MRI? Absolutely. But those risk factors would be other things that don't involve testing. Um, so it's, I know we all like to reach for our tests and look for test results, but I think it's always really important to remember that this is a clinical diagnosis. So again, back to the ILAE, and I know that this looks like a little bit of a busy slide, but we're going to break it out. It's going to be super easy. So we go back to the ILAE to classify our seizure types. 
ultimately this is three buckets. These are seizures that start in a focal location, seizures that start in a generalized location, or seizures that we don't have enough information to get them into the other buckets, okay? So the goal is always to be able to identify, is this a focal or generalized seizure? But if you haven't seen the onset of the seizure or your testing is inconclusive as far as how that seizure starts, you're gonna put them in that unknown or unclassified categories. And it's important to note that we classify seizures based on how they start, not how they end. So I absolutely care how a seizure ends, especially when I'm talking about counseling for safety and all sorts of other things. But when I wanna know how to treat a seizure, I need to know how does that seizure start? Does it start in one location of the brain or does it start all over the brain at the onset? So we're also gonna backtrack and just talk about some of the old terminology because I find that I still hear this quite a bit. And so I think it's always useful to kind of know how to plug that into the new verbiage. Um, so you might still hear grand mal, and that is now tonic-clonic seizures. Um, petty mal used to refer to multiple different types of seizures, but I find when families are using this, they're most often talking about absence. Um, which would be a generalized non-motor seizure. And then complex partial and simple partial are kind of the newest terms that we have graduated out. And so complex partial is now focal with impaired awareness and simple partial is focal aware seizures. Um, and so again, I just find that it's helpful that you still kind of know where those old terms link in so that you can be using the most accurate terms, but that you know how to connect for families in particular that are, that are still using old terminology. All right, so what do we look for? I told you this is a clinical diagnosis. What are we seeing? What am I pulling up to be able to see, hey, I think this is a seizure. Well, the first thing that we wanna do is notice that first, those early warning signs, whether it's a warning sign that you consistently see before somebody has a seizure or whatever happens first that alerts the family to this child is having a seizure. So we ask, you know, what did you see? What did you hear first? What made you pay attention to the child and think that something was happening? Um, were they able to tell you that they felt or sensed something different? And I work in pediatrics, right? Um, so my five and six-year-olds aren't going to go up to their parent and pull on their sweater and say, hey, I'm having gastric uprising today, right? That's not what we're going to see. Um, but what we're going to see is that that child runs to a trusted adult every time right before they have a seizure. That tells us they're probably feeling something, they just can't communicate it. And in older kids, they might tell you, hey, I get a metallic taste in my mouth every time right before I have a seizure um, or butterflies in my stomach or some sort of sensory change. And that's a really helpful warning sign that A, tells me they're gonna have a seizure, but also from a clinical standpoint, helps me localize where those seizures are coming from. And then we wanna know what happened next, right? Um, were they awake? Were they confused? Could they respond? How were they responding to you? What part of their body was involved? How was it involved? What was it doing? Um, did you notice changes in how they spoke or, or their behavior? Um, I will say like technology has totally changed this component of my history, right? Because so many of my families now have videos and they just pull out, my, pull out a video and show it to me, which is really great. Um, but for families that don't, it's really important to get specific with what was happening here. Um, I don't let families get away with just telling me, oh, they were shaking, right? Because shaking could be tremoring. It could be clonic jerking. Um, it could be non-rhythmic jerking. So it's really important to get nitty gritty on what was happening. Um, not just their face was twitching. Was it the right side? Was it the left side? How was it moving? All of that information is really helpful in helping us understand what are we seeing here. And then after it's all done, we want to know how long did it last? How long before they got back to themselves? Were they confused after? Did they have any of that post-ictal behavior that we need to be concerned about? And that's all of that information is going to help us then decide, is this a seizure? And if it is, what type of seizure is it most likely? So as we move into that, we're going to think first about those focal seizures. So focal seizures start in one location of the brain. Um, and you stay there or said. So when we have a focal seizure, the first question we want to ask ourselves is, 
is this patient aware or do they have impaired awareness? And I look at that as can they interact with the world at their baseline, right? Are they able to interact and engage with their environment as they normally are? And they can tell you that they're experiencing something or do they have repetitive speech, nonsensical speech? Are they unable to answer entirely? That would all be in that impaired awareness category. And then once you've decided about their awareness, the next question is, is this a motor or this is a non-motor seizure? I know in neurology, we all like to sound super smart, but ultimately we're asking, are they moving or are they not moving, right? And that's gonna help us define their seizures. And in that motor, you can see that list of all of those different movements. And remember, those all describe how the body's moving, right? Are they having autonomisms where they're having this non-purposeful picking maybe lip smacking or chewing? Are they having clonic jerking or myoclonic jerking? Um, are they having a tonic seizure with stiffening? So all of these different movements that we could see, or is it non-motor where we're having arrestive behavior um, or some of that gastric uprising, right? Some of that autonomic changes that we can have. The hard thing I think that people struggle with is that seizures can look very different based on how they start and where they start. So your semiology is gonna vary based on the seizure spread and the onset. For me, that's kind of fun because then I get to localize where the seizure is coming from based on their symptoms, right? Um, but when we're talking to people who don't have a good background in neurology, it's difficult to understand how different things can all be seizures. So I have a couple of videos that we're gonna share and most of these I have to give credit to the ILAE because they have publicly shared videos that families have consented to us using, which are just fabulous. So if you ever need to look at more videos, I'd always highly recommend going to the ILAE website. Um, but this is a young boy that we're gonna see and you're gonna see some stiffening on that right side. So we see that stiffening and then he paused pauses and has a second seizure that looks more bilateral. So in this, we're seeing that focal tonic seizure, right? Because we're having stiffening primarily at that right side. That left side is still relaxed initially. When the seizure clusters, we see more rapid recruitment to the bilateral hemisphere. And so we see that, that bilateral tonic, but that stiffening is tonic. So this would be a focal, unaware motor seizure. There we go. And then this is another video and you're gonna be watching again, the right side. So we have a very rhythmic jerking of that right upper extremity. You see her left side is relaxed her face we're not seeing any involvement there she appears to be sleeping so i can't tell you if she has any impaired awareness but this is a focal motor seizure and in this one you do see some facial involvement as well we wake up and we look around Again, no one's testing her, so I can't tell you how aware she is during that one. Um, but that, again, would be a focal motor seizure. And that would be a focal motor clonic seizure when we're looking at that. So now we're going to move over to the generalized seizures. Generalized seizures, the seizure starts in both hemispheres at the onset of the seizure. So because it involves both hemispheres, I don't have to ask if they have because they by nature have impaired awareness. If the seizure is in both hemispheres, they have impaired awareness. So then the only question I have to ask, is it motor or is it non-motor, right? So you can see that list of motor symptoms there. Tonic, clonic, that's you know what everyone thinks of when they think of seizures, clonic, tonic, myoclonic, and then we get into these combinations, right? Because seizures don't always just come in one. Sometimes we get a combination of a myoclonic, a tonic, and a clonic, or a myoclonic, a tonic. Um, and then spasms falls into this bucket often as well, although we can see it in focal seizures. And then for generalized, our non-motor are primarily absence seizures. Um, and those we just divide into typical or atypical, and that goes to a little bit of EEG findings, but as well as some physical findings, and then with or without eyelid myoclonia or a myoclonic component. So that those buckets are a little bit easier and shorter. 
So this is a video of a young lady and I want you to watch her shoulders initially. You'll see a quick myoclonic jerk and then you're gonna see that she has an atonic component to this. So we see the jerk and then the head drop. Um, and these often occur in clusters, which is why even though it's so brief, family is able to capture those on video. And then I like to just spend a little bit of time to dig into absence, especially with um, pediatrics, because this is a super common seizure that we see in childhood. Um, and I don't know about you all, I tend to get a, a spike in my absence seizure referrals at the beginning of the school year when new teachers are seeing kids and noticing that abrupt lack of awareness. Um, they have some staring, they'll have some behavior rest. You might see some autonomism, some picking or lip smacking. They might have some eye flutter, that eyelid myoclonia. They're typically right back to themselves. It's super easy to miss. And so that's why teachers often notice these because they have eyes on kids and are interacting and engaging with them at a very high volume. So it's easier for them to pick it up. Um, parents often won't be the first ones to see these because they will assume the child's not paying attention or didn't hear them. Um, and you can often induce these with hyperventilation, which is something I do in clinic where I'll have them sit in a chair and have them breathe on a pinwheel or in a straw very quickly for a little bit to try to see if I can induce one of these seizures. And again, we have a video here and you'll see her breathing, that hyperventilation. And you see that behavior rest, that eyelid myoclonia, little bit of lips. And then typically these kids won't continue to resume, they won't resume the activity that they were doing. They might look around like, well, what was I supposed to be doing? Um, or they might just kind of move on to the next thing, thinking that they have already completed that task. And then epileptic spasms are a rare seizure type, um, but I do always like to comment on them because they're a devastating seizure type. So epileptic spasms can be idiopathic or structural, so they can be fuller, generalized. The peak of this is between four to eight months of age, and we see an increased risk in kids with trisomy 21 and tuberous sclerosis, um, but we can also see this in kids without any known risk factors. We're, we typically are gonna start ACTH or prednisone for first line um, or vigabatrin for patients with tuberous sclerosis. And about half of these kids are gonna to evolve to refractory epilepsies. And that's despite appropriate treatment. So back in the day, we used to think half of them evolved into, or evolved into refractory epilepsy because we weren't using the right drugs. Now we know even when we can get these controlled, about half of these kids are gonna come back with epilepsies in the future. And these are a very distinct seizure type. Um, kids tend to present with developmental regression. They present with these kind of jerks when they're waking from sleep often. Sometimes they'll be irritable around them and they often cluster. So you see that very distinct, almost crunch movement and the flexion and extension of the extremities. Um, so this often can be confused with Sandifer syndrome, um, where they think that babies are just having increased amounts of reflux, but it's actually that spasm, that epileptic spasm. So they can be flexor, which is the most common, and that's what's shown in this video, or kids can have the extensor spasms, where they will actually arch back and extend their arms and legs out. And this is what their EEGs look like. So, so that EEG in the top left corner is a normal EEG. Um, so we see some of that normal resting patterns. And when you compare that to the EEG just below and the EEG to the right, those are EEGs of children experiencing epileptic spasms. And so I always like to tell families and, and when I'm teaching people talk about the, the spasms is kind of the tip of the iceberg. So the spasm is, is just the tip of what we're seeing as far as the disruption that's happening neurologically. 
So that's why even though they might not have a ton of spasms every single day, it's important for us to be aggressive treating these because their EEGs become very abnormal. And that abnormal activity disrupts the normal neuronal development that needs to be happening. And that's why we see that developmental regression during that time. So as we think about mind, you know, EDRG isn't in that epilepsy diagnosis. And so it's really important we do everything that we can to tease out etiology. And that comes down to looking at MRIs, looking at genetic testing to see why does this person have epilepsy? Um, and is there a specific treatment or recommendation that we, we need to be doing to help manage their epilepsy a little bit different? Um, the other important thing to think about is that any seizure can be prolonged. Um, so seizures in and of themselves, when they're brief, we, could, we typically will say they don't cause lasting damage. Now, there are lots of issues that are caused by those seizures, but really what we worry about for risk factors are those prolonged seizures that could lead to status epilepticus. Um, and so we treat seizures when they hit five minutes, but 30 minutes is typically when I really start to get nervous and I want that seizure better controlled. When we think about triggers, you know, it's, it are, these are things that the families can help do, the kids can help to, to reduce their risk of breakthrough seizures. Now they still have epilepsy, they are still at increased risk for seizures, but it's important to give families things that they can control to help reduce their risk. Um, so sleep transitions are high times that we see seizures and poor sleep quality. Um, so always encouraging our teenagers in particular to have regular sleep routines, make sure that they're getting a good night's sleep. Illness, right? We can't control when people get sick, but we can certainly teach them good hygiene to reduce their risk of illness. Stress increases your risk for seizures. And so I always tell families like there can be positive and negative stress, right? Celebrating holidays, going to visit family. Those are all positive things, but they're stressful. Um, and so it's important to kind of manage some of those, control what you can. And when you're undergoing a stressful period, try to manage some of the other stuff if you can. Illicit drug use can increase your risk of seizures as well as some antidepressants. Uh, Burpuin in particular can increase your risk for seizures. So it's important to be mindful of other medications patients might be taking. Um, for our young female patients who have a uterus, we want to be mindful of their menstrual cycles and hormonal changes that can impact their seizures. As kids are older, thinking about alcohol use and then missed medications, right? Um, so everybody misses medications on occasion. It's important to reduce that as much as possible, but a missed medication can trigger seizures. Now I use that to my advantage when I need seizures, um, but at home, it's important to try to do everything that we can to reduce the amount of missed medications. All right, so what do I do, right? When I have a patient and I've said, you have epilepsy, I've figured out what types of seizures they have. How do we treat this? Well, primarily we're gonna treat with anti-seizure medications. Um, and these medications don't treat the underlying cause of why someone has seizures, but they help keep the seizures controlled. Um, so that way, ideally the neurons stop being hyperactive, right? So they, they kind of recalibrate. That doesn't always happen, but that's the goal. It's like giving Tylenol or acetaminophen for a fever, right? You're treating the fever, but you're not treating the virus that's causing the fever. My anti-seizure medicines keep seizures controlled, but they don't treat that underlying cause for increased seizures. And then we need to know how to respond to them. How do we keep people safe during seizures? And then what do we do when the meds don't work, right? Um, so learning how to respond in safety precautions, those are all of our kind of standard keeping patients safe. Um, Epilepsy Foundation and the ILE have great information on this if you need resources for your patients. And we use stay safe side. So stay with the patient, keep them safe and roll them on their side. So we're not gonna put anything in their mouth unless they need an emergency medication that's given that route. Um, we're gonna roll them on their side so that way any saliva or emesis that is coming out will come out and not go in their lungs. And we're gonna time it and keep them safe during that time. Safety precautions are pretty basic, right? Um, we want them to 
not be in high risk situations. So being mindful around public transit, making sure that they're staying further back from the tracks so that if they were to have a seizure, they wouldn't fall onto the tracks. Um, being mindful about being around hot plates or when they're cooking so that they have somebody in the event that they were to fall and burn themselves, someone could turn that off for them. Water is the biggest thing that we need to be mindful of. So having safety around water, um, I let all of my kids shower independently as long as the bathroom door remains unlocked, but bath times need to be supervised. So things that you can do to just reduce their risk of injury. So this is a bit messy, but I promise it makes sense. So this is kind of where my brain goes for how am I treating epilepsy? So when I get a new patient, I'm going to try them on one medication and say, hey, can I get these seizures controlled? If that one medicine doesn't work, they have side effects, whatever it may be, I'm going to move on to a second medicine, or I might add a second medicine. So they might either be on a totally new medicine or two medications instead of one. If I continue to have seizures, at that point, I'm going to move over to that intractable puzzle. All right. But for that whole first, the first and second medicine, my goal is no seizures. I don't want them to have any more seizures. I want to reduce their risk for long-term complications to the best of my ability. But if I've tried two appropriately chosen and appropriately dosed anti-seizure medicines and we're still having seizures, they then meet the criteria for an intractable epilepsy or a drug-resistant epilepsy. And that's where we're start gonna start looking for surgical evaluations for epilepsy surgery or for palliative surgeries and polytherapy with multiple medications and dietary therapy. And our goal there shifts to quality of life. So I want to maximize their quality of life. I want to optimize their seizure control. I want to reduce side effects. And I want to maximize their ability to adhere to the treatment plan. Um, so it really does shift. And this is where I think nurses do just a fantastic job of supporting all of those things um, with the medical team. So you're going to say, why, is, why are two medicines the threshold for saying someone has difficult to treat epilepsy? This is why. So when we pool statistics, looking at all of our medications, with the first medication, we all get to look brilliant. So the first medication, we get about 45 to 48% of patients well-controlled. Well-controlled meaning no seizures. So we start that first medicine and we have a really high success rate for getting patients well-controlled. With that second medication, we only gain about 11% of patients with epilepsy having good seizure control. So we have a huge drop off after that first medicine. And remember, this is appropriately dosed and appropriately chosen. So if you have to abort a medication trial early because of side effects or an allergic reaction, that doesn't count in this puzzle. Um, but if you get to that appropriate dose and you're having seizures, that's what we're looking at. And you get to that third medicine, we have 5% or less who are going to respond the fourth medication is 1% or less. And they actually did studies up to six medications and you get under a percent for any additional medication. And so that's why we say that you have intractable epilepsy if you failed more than two medications. Because at that point, statistically, the likelihood of me getting seizure freedom with additional medications is very, very low. That doesn't mean that we give up on the medicine. It just means we need to be mindful of our other options. So what are those options? They're plentiful, is <laughs> the long and short of it. Um, so I love this chart because I think it really kind of goes over all of the medications. And this doesn't even include all of the new ones because this chart only goes back to 2015. Um, but I think it's just a really good demonstration of where all the medications are. And I always think that it's important to point out that our pie chart, how we moved the needle on how we're controlling epilepsy it hasn't changed with new medicines. Now we haven't redone those studies in the last five years. So I'll be interested to see if we have moved the needle on getting more patients controlled, having fewer intractable epilepsies. But ultimately the newer generation, that third generation of anti-seizure drugs, the big thing that we did is we reduced side effects. So we, re we maximized adherence we didn't really change efficacy. Um, and so depending on where you are, you're gonna have access to different medications. And it's gonna be important to know that, yeah, you might be able to get side effects improved with 
with newer meds, but efficacy can still be very high with old meds. I still use phenobarbital, especially in my young infants. And that is an old anti-seizure medicine, right? But we still use it. Ethosuximide, which we got in the 1960s, is still first line for absence. You can see corticosteroids are still in that, you know, 1950s, 1960s range, and that's still first line um, for, for spasms. So we still use a lot of those older medications. So then the next thing that people always ask is like, how, how do you decide what to use and how do we just combinations to use? And so I love this because this breaks out the different mechanisms that we see our medications come in. And I always give the caveat that, that my meds don't just work on one thing, right? And in the world of neurology, a lot of the meds, like, I mean, they do a few things, right? Um, so there's going to be dabbling in multiple mechanisms of action for a lot of these medicines. But the goal when you're using polytherapy is to think about hitting different receptors. Because if I'm using a sodium channel medication, if I'm using carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine or esleycarbazepine, right, your favorite peen, and I'm not getting seizure control, but maybe I've had improvement, so I want to keep it on, but I've pushed up and I've pushed up and seizures are continuing. If I pick another sodium channel medication, if I go with lamotrigine, I'm just saturating the same receptors, right? So I'm not really maximizing my therapy. But if instead I switch to levetiracetam and I'm using that SV2A instead, then I'm using multiple ways to help reduce that excitatory response and increase my inhibition in the neuron. And so it's really about mixing and matching those mechanisms of action to try to maximize your effect on your neurons. So here, despite the giant list, here's the common ones that we see. Um, Levetiracetam is, is very commonly used in the U.S. as a first-line medication because um, it's very safe and it can treat lots of different seizures. Carbamazepine is often used for people with focal epilepsy. There are new variations of this that you might see. So you could be using carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, or esleycarbazepine. The thing I love about pharmacology is it all sounds the same because it's the same class of medicines, right? Um, and then we use topiramate. I still use a lot of valproic acid. I find it very helpful. Ethosuximide, I mentioned, lamotrigine. So you have a lot of different medicines, but you're going to find in your area, different neurology providers probably have their bucket of about five to 10 medicines that they most commonly use that you'll become familiar with. Despite all of those medicines, what are the things that are common for all of them? Well, they're all CNS depressants. So we're going to see drowsiness for all of these medications when starting them. Most of that drowsiness is going to improve with time. Um, so I always tell families like hang in for a couple of weeks if you can, and it will get better. Um, but many people are going to see that as they start, especially with your sodium channel medications, you're going to see some dizziness, particularly at higher doses. And then lots of the medicines you're going to see GI upset. So it's always good to run patients with them with food. You're going to see mood changes with some of the medications. Levetiracetam is most commonly um, known for this, but on the flip side, some of your anti-seizure medicines actually can have mood improvement. Um, so use that to your advantage when you need it. Most side effects are going to subside in a few weeks. So families can stick it out, ask them to try to stick it out and see if things get better before you give up on a medicine. And then just to be aware that starting and changing meds takes time. So it typically takes a few weeks for us to slowly titrate up into the therapeutic range of medications. And the therapeutic range is huge. So it might take us even longer to continue to titrate to get seizure control. And then just like it takes time to get up, it's going to take time to get down. So all of that has to happen over time. We can't just start and stop medications, unfortunately. So now we're going to briefly move into epilepsy surgery. So our goal with epilepsy surgery is to decrease the number of seizures, right? I'm not going to do surgery if I don't think I can decrease the number of seizures. Sometimes the goal is to eliminate seizures, but in general, we want to reduce them. And we want to reduce or eliminate any risk of deficit. So sometimes depending on the surgery that we're doing and the child, we will accept some amount of deficit coming out of that surgery. 
but we want to minimize it or we want to eliminate the, the deficit if we can. And then the other thing that we wanna do is decrease anti-seizure medicines, right? So typically we're doing surgery because medicines are ineffective um, or they haven't completely controlled the seizures. And so if we can lighten the burden of medications, we certainly wanna do that. And that's gonna reduce our side effects and our long-term side effects for these patients. is an intensive process. So we need to find the epileptogenic zone that we call that localization. Can I figure out where the seizures are coming from? Are there multiple places? So is one place the primary, primary location for seizures or are there multiple places? Um, what does that zone do, right? So is there an eloquent cortex that I need to be mindful of in that region? And is it receptible? So is this in an area where we can even get to, or is it safe to get to? And then we always have to think about what else do I need to know, right? What else do I need to know to make this decision? And so this, as I said, is our extensive pre-op workup. So this looks at getting EEG both interictal between seizures as well as ictal during the seizure looking at that imaging, looking at the neuropsychology, where, there's, where is their cognitive baseline right now? Um, looking at functional MRI, at PET scans, at SPECT scans, at MEGS, and different institutions have different styles that they do, but all of this is the goal is the same, right? To try to figure out where seizures are coming from and what else lives there. So we currently in the United States, the 3T is the highest commercially available scanner, but some of the research institutions are using 7T. And I just like to show the comparison of how much more detailed images are getting, um, because as we continue to progress with our images, they're gonna get more and more detailed. And I have a feeling we're gonna see more, and more epilepsies that we're gonna be able to surgically resect. And then here's an example of a PET scan. You can see my arrow pointing to the region of low uptake. So when we do PET scans, we always mirror them with an EEG because if a patient's having a seizure during the PET scan, I expect there to be higher metabolic uptake in that area. If they're not having a seizure during the PET scan, I expect it to have lower uptake because that area isn't, is dysfunctional. It's not working as effectively. And then once we're done with phase two, phase one, we go to phase two. Um, we don't necessarily use this for everybody, but a lot of patients we do. And this is where we're going to do direct recording from the brain. Um, and so we can do that open craniotomy or burr holes. We can do subdural electrodes. And you can see this image. You can see that coverage of the subdural electrodes. And then on the right is what our epileptologists look at as they try to figure out where those grids were and looking at the EEG to figure out where seizures are coming from and if they're doing any language mapping. So you can see on this one, the purple colors were where they found language, the yellow were, was uh, motor and uh, purple, and then blue was sensory. So you can see all of that, how they map out and figure out where is the eloquent cortex. We also use depth electrodes where we can actually get into deeper areas of the brain tissue to see where those seizures are coming from. Because if I'm reading out on the skull, sometimes I'm not getting an accurate picture of what's happening because we get diffusion of that um, electrical activity. And this is what that EEG looks like. So to me, this is just like an overwhelming amount of information, but you can see how much more detailed we can get as we're looking at the EEG um, so that we can actually know where those seizures are coming from. So those uh, green and blue lines are our depth electrodes. And then you can see all of those grids that are on there too. So we can see from this that higher amplitude rhythmic um, waveforms in the depth, in the blue depth electrodes. And that will help them localize it to that blue. Um, it's the depth, the third depth. And I don't have their chart to know where that was, but you can see that's where the seizure was starting. So when we think about nursing care for these patients, most of these patients are gonna be in the ICU for video EEG monitoring and monitoring for complications. So we've got those grids, we need to be monitoring for bleeding, infection, making sure that they're not pulling at things. Those patients are gonna be at increased risk for seizures because I want them to have a seizure, right? I wanna capture that on all of those EEGs. So I've stopped medications, often I'll sleep deprive these kids. So I really push them to have seizures making sure that we're managing pain, nausea, vomiting, and then knowing if the surgeon left the bone flap off, just so you know if you need to be following um, 
craniectomy precautions. So our different epilepsy surgeries, you hear that lumectomy, that lumectomy, which is commonly temporal, hemispherotomy, corpus callosotomy, and then our stereotactically laser ablation. And we're gonna choose these based on where the seizures are coming from, what else is going on with the patient, um, how many seizures or seizure types are they having, all of that's gonna, gonna change how we decide how to approach the seizures. And it's important to note that this isn't a single person who's making these decisions. So our team is, is comprised of their primary epilepsy provider, whether that's a nurse practitioner or a physician. And then we work with our epileptologist um, who's reading the EEG and looking at that. We look at, work with our neuroradiologists and we have specific pediatric epilepsy surgery neuroradiologists that we work with. Um, our neurosurgery team, our EEG technologist. So we have all of these people who have expertise in this field, looking at all this information and deciding what's gonna be best for this patient. And then these, I'm gonna give photo credit to Dr. Kathy Cartwright. Um, so these are some great images of placing those grids. Um, and I always think it's helpful from my perspective because I don't go into the OR. And so I always like to know what is it that my patient was experiencing when they were in the OR. Um, and so you can see this is how that they open that up and place those grids in there. We can do some less invasive techniques for those depth electrodes, um, which utilize burr holes. But again, I just think it's helpful to see all of these images. And then I'm briefly going to talk VNS with a, a palliative surgical approach. Um, and, and all surgical approaches can be palliative if the goal is to reduce instead of eliminate seizures, but VNS by nature is a palliative approach. So VNS is a vagus nerve stimulator. So this is typically recommended for medically intractable epilepsy and for candidates who aren't, um, or for people who aren't a candidate for surgical resection. So if I can take the portion of the tissue out that's causing the seizures, that would be my goal. But if I can't, then I want to consider VNS for them. Uh, VNS was approved in 2010 in Japan, and it was approved for all patients with refractory epilepsy. In the United States, it's approved for patients with focal epilepsy. Um, and I believe it's approved for 12 and up, but we have a lot of experience implanting it for um, children under the age of 12, as well as people with generalized epilepsy as opposed to focal epilepsy. The generators implanted under the skin. Um, so typically patients are gonna have two incisions. They're gonna have an incision in their, in their chest for the generator and then an incision in their neck and they'll tunnel those wires under the neck. We don't actually know how the VNS works. We think that it interrupts that organization of the epileptic discharges. Tomorrow we talked about the hypersynchronous activity. We think that it interrupts that but we also know that overall it decreases the excitability of the neurons. So the longer that it's in, the more effective it will be. So just some take homes for VNS, the device is always giving a maintenance dose. So you don't actually have to do anything for a patient to get benefit from the VNS. It, they will receive that at a maintenance dose that's prescribed. The magnet, which is the device that you can use to help trigger a stronger impulse, usually stays on for between 60 or 30 seconds. And there's a lockout system. So if a patient's having a seizure and you go to swipe that VNS magnet and you think, oh, I don't know if it worked or maybe you know they're still seizing, you can continue to swipe. The device is only gonna give that extra impulse when it's safe to do so. So it's okay for you to swipe. It's okay for families to swipe. The magnets that they use are a very strong magnet. So if you have them in your office, be careful. Um, but they're not specific to the device. So we always keep boxes of extra magnets in our office that we can give to families because they get lost. They get stuck in the washer. Um, they get lost in the bottom of a backpack or the school wants one and families need one or other childcare people need one. And so they just need multiple magnets. Um, so just keep extras and hand them out when families need them. But because that device is giving a maintenance dose, not all families are going to use the magnet, either because seizures are brief or they don't find the magnet useful. So it's always helpful if a patient comes into the hospital to ask if they use that magnet or not, because if they do, you can make it a part of their seizure first aid. If they don't, you can skip that part and go to your standard medications for seizure first aid. 
Um, and that I will say thank you. I, I wanted to give you all my contact information in case questions or concerns came up later. Um, and then epilepsydiagnosis.org is a great resource for um, any information about epilepsy. It's run by the ILAE, which is the International League Against Epilepsy. So they also have materials in multiple languages, which is really helpful to make sure that you have the best information that you can provide to your families. Thank you, Dr. Erin, for a great lecture. I will, I will ask Dr. Izumo for a um, comment on this lecture. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Erin Feske, for your excellent presentation about pediatric epilepsy. I felt that higher education, and I listened to it very interestingly as I was a student at medical school. I think proper treatment based on proper diagnosis for epilepsy is very important especially for children. And I think it's crucial to be aware of parents that their children may have uh, epilepsy, I mean epilepsy symptoms, N in order to accelerate their awareness and lightning activities are important. Can you tell me what kind of aware awareness raising activities do you do in the United States as a nurse practitioner? Please. Thank you. That that's a great question, and I agree. You know, parents are our front line in helping know if something is going on with their child. Um, so, Epilepsy Foundation is our um, big organization in the United States that helps awareness and support um, increased awareness of different types of seizures. So, a few years ago, they actually did an ad campaign um, on TV where families could see how seizures looked different um, and sharing real videos of patients having a, a number of different seizure types. And so I think that that's always really helpful. And I will say, you know, as hard as social media sometimes is, it has also really raised families' awareness that seizures can look different. I can't, can't even begin to say how many times I have families come into my clinic and say, I posted this video about my child and someone said this could be a seizure. And so that has really honestly been very helpful for us. Um, there's also new state laws that are coming out. Um, Missouri, which is in the center part of the United States, just had a new state law where teachers have to undergo seizure first aid and seizure recognition training. Um, and that was uh, because of a lot of advocacy from organizations and parent organizations. But I think that's another level not only the teachers as educators are going to have better recognition of seizures, but the teachers as parents themselves will have better recognition of seizures. So I think they're doing a lot to really improve the awareness of how different seizures can look for different people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your uh, great activities. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Professor hey, Izum. Question, uh, do we have another question from the audience? Somebody raised hand. You have any question? Maybe it was uh, one question, Doctor How do you um, give moral support to parents with children with epilepsy? I, I find it very difficult to face uh, uh, these parents when I have patients with epilepsy. How do you give moral support to them? Yeah, and, and I think I do what we all do, right? We all meet our families, our patients on a very human level of it's normal to have fear and anxiety about your child. Um, and that's why I think talking about the things that we can control is really helpful for families. When you look at parental anxiety in epilepsy, you see a big spike in parental anxiety at the diagnosis, and then it tapers off. Kids, on the other hand, the child experiencing anxiety has lower anxiety at the beginning, and then it increases. So I spend the majority of my time in those first couple of appointments really giving them as much information as I can about everything. And, and I mean everything from what your child's diagnosis is to what you can do in a seizure to, I even talk about SUDEP, which is sudden unexpected death and epilepsy in that first visit. And I do it not to scare them, but to empower them and give them everything that I have 
so that they know what they can control and they recognize the symptoms and, and they can kind of get through that. And then as my time with patients shifts, I start to shift more of that focus onto the child as their anxiety likelihood increases. And so we start gearing more of the education to them as we move on. Um, but it's hard. You have to meet everybody where they're at. So I think really gauging your families and finding out what works best for them is important because not everyone is going to take that information in the same way. Thank you for that question. I, I, I could talk about my families and my patients all day long. <laughs> Prof. Eddie, anything to comment? Uh, thank you once more. Uh, as I noted, you use phenobarbital, uh, and I believe it's a great drug. If you use it also in uh, adult population, even if it's very, uh, it's one of the oldest drugs for in the epilepsy in epilepsy treatment. However, um, very good, very good lecture, and uh, you showed your. Um, your diagnostic way of the patient and what you do uh, with magnetic resonance, PET CT, et cetera, uh, which uh, we have very uh, often, we have a question from the parents, if we go for the treatment, surgical treatment, uh, does, our, does our kid need more drugs? So it's very, very open question. Uh, what is your uh, opinion on rate of success of the lesionectomy and uh, vagus nerve stimulation? And how often do you have to use AED drugs uh, after this treatment, uh, which is the rate of failure? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so great question. Um, lesionectomy is going to vary based on where it is. Um, and that primarily has to do with what the lesion was, as well as how aggressive we are to kind of clear those borders, depending on eloquent cortex. Um, so that conversation, it tends to be very specific, but if you have a well-circumscribed lesion, your likelihood of seizure freedom is pretty high. Um, I don't want to give you a percentage off the top of my head, because I think I would misspeak, but um, we often will keep patients on their anti-seizure meds for minimum three, but most commonly six months after epilepsy surgery to allow complete healing of that region prior to trying to decrease their medications. And so we tell families that ahead of time. I will say in my clinical experience, I often have to decrease medications in the immediate period post-operatively because patients are suddenly much more sedated on the same doses of anti-seizure medication because you've eliminated that excitability. Um, for VNS, we look long-term. So um, when I'm talking about VNS with patients, we talk about six months minimum before we really see seizure improvement. So it takes a long time. And most of the literature will, will talk even about a year before you're seeing that significant seizure improvement. Our success for VNS is rated as a 50% improvement in their seizure frequency. So we're not talking about seizure elimination. 50% of patients are going to have a greater than 50% seizure reduction. And so for those patients, it's decreasing the medication and either maintaining their seizure frequency or keeping the seizure frequency at a lower rate with the VNS. And so I, from the get-go, tell my patients who are getting a VNS, you will still be on anti-seizure medications, that it's a reasonable goal to say we want to decrease the medicines, but you will still be on those anti-seizure medicines. So I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, yeah, it answers. It's quite a similar strategy, especially with the drugs which we use after the treatment. Uh, and uh, just one more question. Uh, posterior fossa lesions are usually not related to epilepsy, usually I'm saying. What is your experience on that field with the posterior fossa lesion in pediatric um, population? Yeah, so I only see epilepsy. Um, and I can't say off the top of my head that I've ever had a patient with a posterior fossa lesion. Um, so I, I think it's probably as similar to what you've experienced that those don't result in epilepsy. Yeah, because then we don't have to use the drugs. And the third one is a comment about keto, uh, keto diet. Mm -hmm. how, how does it actually, it's actually questions, how does it influence uh, the, the way how you treat the epilepsy with the drugs? Um, so very similar to um, VNS. 
except the timing looks a little bit different. So for ketogenic diet, um, we do a week long induction period to get them on the ketogenic diet. And then we follow up in one month to make sure that they're stable on the diet. At three months, if they've had improvement in seizures, we'll start reducing their medications. The only patients that I typically see come entirely off medications are those patients who have a genetic dysfunction at SLC2A. So our GLUT1 transporter deficiency patients for whom ketogenic diet is the recommended therapy. Um, the remainder of my patients are gonna stay on at least one anti-seizure medication. Um, and then we maintain the ketogenic diet like we do any other anti-seizure medication. So two years, no seizures, we'll consider weaning it off. If a patient is not having any major side effects, continues to have infrequent seizures, but has had improvement on ketogenic diet, we'll continue the ketogenic diet for as long as it's medically safe to do so. Um, but we do use it very frequently um, for a lot of our patients, both patients that eat by mouth, as well as patients that um, take nutrition via G-tube or J-tube. Mm, okay. Thank you so much. And I believe that uh, it's very late in Japan, so we should end this <laughs> session. Uh, Professor Yoko Kato, any, any comments from you? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, please. We don't hear you. Before that, before my talk, maybe I, I want to listen of the uh, doctor, uh, Erin. Uh, you gave me some comment, please. Can you say that again? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. No, no, just I want to ask uh, the uh, doctor, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Dr. Cassie. You want to make some comments? Yes, uh, that's the most excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Feske, and I thought you did a really nice job of uh, going over the management and the, and the treatment of these children. And I just had one thing to ask you. Uh, mental health is so important today, and I know the children, uh, you said as they get older, they get become more anxious, uh, or not older, but longer uh, into the process. Could you just briefly say something about depression in children who have epilepsy because, um, you know, with peers, it's just, it, it just seems like an overwhelming thing. I, I think Dr. Kathy is alluding to my, my pet passion and my pet project of treating depression in patients with epilepsy. Um, so I started work in my clinic where we routinely screen all of our youth for depression. Um, and if they're positive, we go ahead and, and our neurology team will go ahead and start medications and get them referred in for um, therapy. Access is hard, which is why we have really been aggressive about saying we can go ahead and start those antidepressants in a safe way for patients. Um, but it's really important that we talk to our patients about it, that we provide them the resources that we can um, and that we're very open about screening patients so that we, we can save lives ultimately if we're treating depression and anxiety because it does reduce risk of um, suicidal ideation and death by suicide. So definitely a, a pet passion for me. Thank you, Dr. Pesky. <clears throat> can I talk something? So uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, the first of all, just, just Dr. Uh, Andre. So that you showed us very nice, very important uh, things. But recently, uh, uh, you should innovate the, your your own uh, maybe some uh, instrument. Maybe the, the recently I'm, I'm thinking about very tiny penetrated clip because uh, uh, when when we want to skip a small artery, not such as the IC, not such a large vessels. But sometimes uh, when we deal with the MC analysis, then we want to skip with just a small, tiny uh, vessels. <clears throat> For the purpose, I, I think such a small uh, penicillin clip, and also we need more uh, angle. So please, uh, in, innovate <laughs> your side. Okay. So do, do you do you innovate your own uh, the? Uh, instrument? Maybe Dr. Ismo sensei, maybe uh, he can do it, I think. Okay, thank you. I, uh, uh, I, sometimes I thinking about developing uh, more, uh, more precise uh, instrument for 
uh, detaching uh, small arteries from the aneurysmal dome because uh, sometimes the arteries uh, is very very uh, has a very very strong attaching uh, to the aneurysmal uh, wall and uh, I don't have uh, uh, any instruments uh, for uh, for detaching it uh, and uh, uh, sometimes I um, uh, I uh, injured uh, these small arteries and uh, if it uh, as perforators uh, of uh, lenticular striate arteries it uh, may be a very uh, uh, great neurological deficit after it uh, coagulation uh, what and uh, uh, i think about uh, uh, new instruments uh, uh, maybe in future i yes. present it <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So uh, we can see everything, even with the endoscope. But uh, sometimes we cannot do anything because it's too far. And so many perforators before reach such a such target. Maybe it's must I say you can say something about innovation of the, the instrument and also Dr. HGI. Thank you, Professor Yogokato. Actually, I use uh, uh, only commercially available uh, things, uh, grips or uh, instruments, or uh, exoscope, endoscope. But uh, we should uh, cover the uh, uh, covered by our technique, uh, uh, by, uh, complicated uh, situation. But uh, we should innovate uh, 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 some instruments for uh, the uh, com complicated uh, uh, situation. And uh, but I think exoscope is uh, more, more and more uh, popular in Japan, and uh, that is very useful uh, technology for us uh, neurosurgeons nowadays. Uh, so. Uh, Actually, I published uh, some paper about exoscopic surgery uh, in as in general of neurosurgery. Uh, please find it. Thank you. Thank you. You want to say something? <clears throat> yes, sir. For in my opinions, I think I want to innovate about the surgical bed uh, during surgery because it's nice. Uh, in my country, when when I want to perform the high bit surgery, uh, one surgeon regular like, uh, need to have uh, like a pin fixation on the head, but in another surgeon need to uh, perform the in the wasra in the guard puncture. But uh, the surgical uh, bed is cannot like uh, can can uh, we we cannot see uh, the vessel uh, via full scope. Because uh, some some babies have limitation uh, by objectify from the uh, con contract medium when we inject. So if we have like a the the for uh, like a uh, the the bed that we can see about the contract when we inject the contract, it's not obscure about the uh, right like a full scope. But I think this is a, a good one. But now in many company there like uh, develop this kind of surgical bed, but uh, but in some country they have some limitation because uh, the high cost of uh, this device. This this is my dream. Mm. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> I finally just I want to thank you very much for the Dr. Erin and the Dr. The Kelsey. And the uh, nurse practitioner is uh, very, very important in Japan now. So, but uh, you are very high level. It's uh, very, very, I, I think, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, um, encourage us very much. So, so we have uh, just 500 uh, uh, nurse practitioner. So we need more and more in the future, I think. And also the, your, the high level is uh, very important for Please teach us. Uh, uh, yeah, Cassie, or maybe the teachers, uh, the teaching nurses. So we will contact you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. We, uh, you know, I, I love getting to do what I do and working with my physician colleagues, I think has been huge, right? Because 
they support uh, the nursing staff and show you kind of where you can fit in um, and where you can support your patients the best. And it's important that we have kind of that multidisciplinary team to educate and support each other to our highest degree and to, to that education level, right? That it, it takes time everywhere, but I think there's a, a great avenue for nurse practitioners to support patients and provide improved access to patients in regions that don't necessarily have that high level access to care. Nurse practitioners can provide high level care in those regions, which is fantastic. Thanks so much. Dr. Hetty, anything you want to say? If not, if that's nothing, I think we've come to the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Andre, Dr. Edith, for the informative uh, lectures. And thank you, all the chairs and commentators, for your time and your support. Till we meet again. Thank you very much. Bye bye.